Welcome to Capital City Church. This has been a great morning so far, and I know it's going to continue. I have a question for you. Um, have any of you in your life ever doubted, either doubted your faith, doubted that you were in the right job, doubted that you lived in the right state? Have you ever struggled or thought about or had any issues whatsoever with doubt? Has anyone can yep, doubt? All of us have from time to time struggle with doubt. Jesus said, don't doubt. Now, of course, he was talking spiritually about doubting salvation, doubting the fact that he is God, that he paid the price for our sins and that we, through a personal relationship with him, can spend eternity with him. But he tells us not to doubt, that we don't have to doubt, but yet you and I still choose sometimes to doubt. Now, we don't schedule doubt. It doesn't pop up at three o'clock on a Friday and we look at our, our calendar or our phone and say, okay, it's time for me to doubt. It's time for me to be afraid. It just just pops up sometimes in our weakest moments. The definition of doubt is one that I want to point you to as we begin our time together. And it's in your notes. If you have your app, you can uh, download the PDF uh, there under the notes section of the app, or you can just follow along with us this morning. But doubt is a feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. A feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. And it happens to us sometimes in the most random parts of life, but also in some of the most significant and important parts of life. When it happens in our spiritual life, we have to be careful because although doubt is natural, if we do not guard ourselves and work through it, it can be something, well, that can be dangerous. And there are really two parts, two facets of doubt. And this is true in any area of life, but of course we are talking about our walk with God, with the gospel and with our life choosing to follow him. The first is, is it true? Have you ever just sat back and looked at Christianity somewhat objectively through the eyes of someone who's not a Christian? Have you ever just stepped back and thought, you know, this stuff looks and sounds a little bit unlikely. Now, I don't want you to, to criticize me or to think that I'm, uh, you know, a heretic or, or anything else. But I mean, just step back for a second and, and look at the narrative. Look at the creation narrative. Look at the end times narrative that I gave you just a couple of weeks ago. The way that we believe the world came into being, the way that we believe we're supposed to live, the way that the world is going to end and what's going to happen after, after death. And it requires faith and evidence, but sometimes we struggle with doubt. Is it true? It's a fair question to ask. I sat down not too long ago with a friend, wasn't a Christian, and they're like, seriously? And I said, what do you mean? They said, the ark, the animals, the flood, Noah. Are you kidding me? You really believe that? And I love conversations like that because particularly for somebody who's finding their faith, you work through these things. But once we've found our faith, we have to hang on to the reality of our faith and we have to come to the conviction that yes, it's true. Now, after we have dealt with that, after we have arrived at the conclusion based on evidence and also on faith that yes, it's true, then a much harder question pops up. One that we have to answer often in our lives. And that is, is it worth it? Because the commands, the principles, the instructions that Jesus gives, the way that we're supposed to live that's so different from our natural instinct, from the way the world around us lives, so countercultural, so counterintuitive, deny yourself and follow me, leave your old life behind and live a different way. Is it worth it? And we have to answer that question for ourselves. And we continue to answer that question as we face situations in life that come up that require us to make choices that are hard choices, life choices, based on is it true and is it worth it? Now, I'll tell you, I believe 100% it's true. I believe the Bible is God's word, that it's inspired and fallible that there are no errors in it as it was communicated by the Holy Spirit to the, the pen of a human author. And I believe the way it unfolds, the way the world was created, how we're supposed to live, who Jesus is and how things end, I believe 100% that it's true. I also believe that it's worth it. But as you'll see in the second half of our time together, 
what we believe in our heads, we have to come to know in our lives before it really changes who we are. To allow us to not be shaken by doubt. And that's where we're heading today. Now I have a, a friend, uh, Sheriff Snyder, who's the, um, the sheriff for the Polk County Sheriff's Department. And um, Pastor Jared and I went over and spent some time talking to him. As I mentioned to you, doubt happens in every area of life. It doesn't just happen in uh, a spiritual walk. It happens in career choices. It happens in relationships. It happens all the time. And I was just thinking about Sheriff Snyder and thinking that he's been a, a law enforcement officer for, as you'll see, 42 years. And as he's worked through his 42 years, he has had to over and over again wrestle with those two ideas. Is it true? Do I still believe? And is it worth it? And so I just want to let you listen to this video real quickly, then we'll come back uh, together and continue our time. And I really hope that you've come today ready to lean in and let God speak to you because today could be a day where he sets you free from some things that have really been possibly plaguing you, you've been struggling with, or maybe somebody you know or love has been struggling with. Today could be that day and I pray that it is. Let's watch this together. Hey, Capital City Church, it's Pastor Rick, and I'm here with a special guest today, my friend, Sheriff Kevin Schneider with the Polk County Sheriff's Department. Uh, thank you for being here today. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Now, you have a big job, and I only know a little bit about your big job, but um, you are in charge of the largest sheriff's department in the state of Iowa. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Almost 600 employees, uh, $80 million budget, and hoping to go up a little bit here uh, pretty soon. Well, unfortunately, I was going to need to go up just because of uh, the food operations and costs. And one of the big things we do is we house about 1,100 inmates a day. And uh, when you're making 3,000 plus meals a day, the food costs uh, quickly increase. Good gracious. And uh, you're also responsible for providing 911 support for over 30 first responder organizations in, in the state. So yes, correct. So it's a big job. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Now I'm talking about doubt. Jesus said, don't doubt. And you know, doubt really has two parts. We ask questions from time to time. Um, is it true? And is it worth it? And that's what we'll be talking about this morning. And that's what I wanted to talk with Sheriff Snyder about um, today. Now, I have read from your bio that um, you've been in law enforcement for 40 years. Yes, sir. And that as a child, you saw something that just made you decide that your direction was going to be law enforcement. And uh, you just took off that direction. What uh, what happened? Well, I just saw an officer that, uh, that did a kind deed in a critical situation for an uh, individual. And that made me realize that, hey, I think that's something that I want to do and uh, got involved in the Law Enforcement Explorer program uh, back in the, as a kid and uh, continued to uh, go forward and, and work uh, with the uh, Explorer post until I was old enough to become a law enforcement officer. And I came to the sheriff's office in 1981 and I'm still here. And still here. You've been the sheriff since 2018. Correct. And uh, elected in 2020 and then uh, hopefully again here in 2024. Yes, sir. All right. Awesome. Now, when you went to DMAC and you were learning to be a law enforcement officer and what it was all about, um, what did they teach you? What was the foundational principle of being uh, a person who enforces the law? Is that easy to put into uh, to words? I think the bottom line and it's very simple. It's how to treat people mm -hmm. because we're a people business. And a lot of folks forget that. Uh, but uh, we're the first guys you call. Uh, when there's a crisis and we're the last guys you, you want to call when you're doing something wrong. Right. But uh, we're never, uh, you know, in the middle usually. Mm -hmm. But so it's, uh, it, I think the bottom line that comes down to it is we, you learn the basics, you learn the essentials, you go by the law. Uh, but the bottom line is, is you treat people the way you'd like to be treated or you'd like to have your mother treated. So over 40 years, um, beginning with um, classroom experience and explorer training programs, and then now ending up uh, as the sheriff of the largest sheriff's department in the state, um, your mission statement, uh, if I remember correctly, involves several things. One is sort of a preventative community involvement to, to kind of get ahead of a lot of what may be going on and just be a liaison to the community. Number two, it mentions impartial um, application of the law, uh, fairly trying to, to help um, keep things in order. Uh, number three, it was uh, it mentioned something about the jails, which you guys have done a phenomenal job, the largest jail in the state, and you oversee that, as you've mentioned. Uh, and then technology and using cutting edge technology to be able to help solve crimes and to keep us current so that we do a good job for the people. Um, over the 40 years, um, is it still true what you've been told and what you believe? Is it still just part of, of who you are? Do you believe it? 
Well, if I said I didn't have doubts on certain days, I would be lying to you. There are days that I, I have some doubt. You get frustrated. Um, but uh, when, you, when you look down deep, uh, I'm still here after 42 years. That tells you something. Mm -hmm. I still believe uh, in the mission. I believe in the uh, folks that work here at the sheriff's office and the community. So when there's doubt, uh, if you wait just a short amount of time, usually there's something or someone who will change that doubt for you mm -hmm. and you realize that you're doing what's right. And that leads me into another question. And um, you know, I didn't uh, ask your permission to ask this. So I hope it's okay. But over a 42 year career, um, there had to be some downtime, some bad times. Was there ever a time when uh, you just wondered if it was worth it, that you really you know, wondered why you were doing this? Is that something you'd care to elaborate on? Well, absolutely. It's uh, there, there's been several different times. Uh, the one was uh, when another officer who was my best friend uh, from junior high school, and he's also in the Explorer program with me, and uh, we were roommates. And uh, he ended up committing suicide, job-related stress. Wow. And uh, so that asked me, that made me ask myself, was it really worth it? Is it worth all the all the stuff that we see, we go through, and all the uh, uh, images in our mind that we have to harbor. And this was way before they anybody would admit that law enforcement have mental health issues or mental health stress. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was probably the biggest thing that made me really wonder um, whether it was all worth it. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to talk to a young man coming out of high school, you know, like you were at one point, um, in, involved in a cadet or an explorer program, and they asked you, um, you know, should I pursue this as a career? What advice would you give them now, um, it, this side? Well, that's a that's a difficult uh, question to answer. And uh, obviously, as an employer, I would say we're the best best thing happening out there. We want you. You're going to be uh, working for the best uh, sheriff's office in the country. But we also now have a, a lot different. Uh, job duties. So we have a lot of versatility. So you may not be a patrolman. You may not want to be out there pushing the car and responding to calls. You may want to be in the corrections department and working in the jail side of it, which has a lot of facets to it as well. And and you may find yourself being, and, and I tell the officers, you're more of a counselor than you are, than are an enforcer, right. and uh, especially when they're in the jail. So we have a lot of different choices. But the bottom line is, that's the nice thing about the cadet program. Try it. See if you like it, because if you love it, mm -hmm. the old saying is you never work a day in your life. Right. And if you love coming to work, then uh, you found the right business. Excellent. Now, you have a beautiful facility here. I know a lot of our people have seen it. You drive by it, and it's fairly new, just a couple years, I suppose, or not even that, maybe. Right. We're just almost getting to be two years old. All right. And uh, I've, I've been in your office, and I know that uh, you have a great view uh, out, out of your office. You overlook the parking lot of our church, right? That is correct. <laughs> you actually look into Pastor Jared's office, which I think is, is really good. If you could actually assign some surveillance, maybe that would help. Let us know if any shady characters are coming in and out. Oh, I thought it was if I was in there catching him playing basketball into the tar trash. Is that what he's been doing? I yeah, think that's excellent. part of it. <laughs> All right. Uh, we really do love having you guys as neighbors. And, you know, through CityServe, it's been a privilege to support your department now for about six years. And we deal a lot with um, with your deputies, the people who are in the cars, driving around, you know, doing a lot of the stuff that people never see and that we appreciate and expect when we need it. And you just have some of the best men and women I've ever met who work for you and who serve our county. And so I'm grateful for that. What's the best part about your job? What do you love about what you do? Why do you keep doing it? Well, I always say because I wouldn't have been a good pastor. Mm -hmm. That'd be yeah. part of it. But uh, I love it. And uh, uh because I get to give back to the community, involved in the community, get to help folks. You get to see them when th times are good, and you get to see them when times are bad. Yeah. And uh, I'm lucky uh, because I do have the best staff in the country, and I stand behind that. They make me look good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know that they work for me. I, uh, I think I work for them. Yeah. And uh, my job is to try to get them the best equipment, the best facility like this building mm -hmm. that we could possibly have. So as long as I can keep doing that, then I'll keep coming to work. And as long as I keep enjoying coming to work, I'll come to work. And Because I've had that discussion, and I said, when, when's it time for me to retire? And everybody said, you'll know. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I said, well, I figured most of my staff will tell me when it's time for me to go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so having be, being able to do that, that's just like we just had trunk or treats. Right. Those are the fun things that we get to do. Right. The car shows, the things that we get to partner with the community on. Those are the fun things that we get to do. And uh, so that makes the job when it's when it's. Mm -hmm. getting you down that kind of brings you back up a little bit so right. those are the things that uh, keep me going now you mentioned car show um, we love hosting a car show here to support um, your cadet program and uh, i understand you're a car guy 
I am. You're a, are you a Chevy guy, unfortunately? I am a Chevy guy, yes, sir. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'm uh, I'm pretty open. If you want to give me like a 32 Ford Roadster, I wouldn't you complain. Take it. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask for a favor. One of our pastors uh, drives a black Corvette. You've met him, Dan Shows, S-H-O-W-S, mm-hmm. and he drives too fast. Yep, and I see I'm, that coming to parking lot. I'm just wondering if you could maybe keep an eye out for that, you know, and slow him down a little bit. Just taser, maybe not a ticket, just scare him a little bit. That'd be well, great. Well, you could probably make that happen. But, you know, him and I were both having a discussion during the car show about that little piece of concrete out there, how it would make a real good burnout pit. So I don't know yeah. which one's worse, him or me. Sheriff Snyder, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us today. I sincerely appreciate it and uh, appreciate pleasure. what you do for us. I appreciate Sheriff Snyder sharing just about his career. And you may resonate in your own career, the life that you've chosen, the decisions that you make. You years ago that you have to follow through with. Um, we in CityServe, uh, you guys through CityServe, we support the Sheriff's Department, we support the Highway Patrol, the Des Moines Police Department, the Ankeny Police Department, um, also uh, Fire Department, Sadell Fire Department here next to us, and then uh, the Des Moines Public Schools and Sadell Public Schools. If any of you guys are interested in being a part of CityServe and serving these organizations on a monthly basis, consistently and creatively, uh, just notify the church office and Kathy will be happy to, to put you with the perfect opportunity to get involved in doing that. Um, Sheriff Snyder talked about how he had times where even though he still believes that he doubts. Um, speaking about faith particularly, there have been times when even though I still believe, sometimes it's just hard not to doubt. So to remind you of a story, to just kind of prime the pump and get us ready for where we'll be at the end of our time together in John chapter six, I just want to remind you of the story of Peter walking on the water. Now, Pastor Brandon talked to you about this not too long ago. I've shared this story with you several times, but I want us to really focus in on one particular statement of Jesus. And maybe you'll relate to this. If you remember the story, Peter and the rest of the disciples were in a boat in the middle of a lake, in the middle of a storm. And the storms of life, um, they, uh, they happen to all of us. And they're unexpected. And sometimes it seems like Jesus sends us right into them. And maybe you're in a storm right now, or maybe you have somebody in your life who's in a storm who's dealing with circumstances beyond their control that are a little bit scary, that you are overwhelmed or overwhelmed for someone? Does that connect? Does it ring a bell? I mean, I certainly can relate to that. It seems like if I don't have something in my own life, I've got something in somebody else's life that, that just seems a little overwhelming, a little, a little big, a little scary. The disciples were in a boat, many of them thinking that Jesus had probably been killed In the middle of a storm, they turn and they see the figure walking out to them on the water. And so Peter, the spokesperson for the group, he says, is that you, Jesus? Again, a paraphrase. If it's you, then tell me to come to you. And as you know, the story goes, Jesus said, yes, come to me. And so Peter steps over the side of the boat in the middle of the storm, staking his very life on the fact that it's true. Jesus Christ is worth living for, is worth following, is worth obeying. It's true. And as he walked toward Jesus, he was walking on water. The things in his life that seemed so important in one moment weren't that important. And then what happened? He began to focus on the storm, the waves, the wind, all of the stuff out of control, how illogical it was to be walking on water. And he began to sink. And maybe you know the sinking feeling, the feeling that comes when we take our eyes off Jesus and we we wonder maybe it's not true in the first place. Maybe we're crazy. Maybe here we are out on a limb. We're gonna die. So he prays a prayer that maybe you've prayed before. Now it didn't come out like a prayer. It came out like a statement. Jesus help me, right? And throws a hand up. And Jesus, he doesn't say, sorry, You never should have taken your eyes off me. Sink and pay the price. The Bible tells us that Jesus stuck out his hand and took Peter by the hand, led him to safety. After they were back in the boat, after the storm was calmed, there was a teaching moment. And so Jesus, as he probably put his arm around Peter, close to the other disciples, come on, get close, eye contact, let's have a moment. He says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Well, it was scary. Yeah, but do you have that little faith? It was overwhelming. But yeah, is your faith that small? 
but we thought we were gonna die. But don't you trust me? And there's this relationship between faith and doubt that has existed for thousands of years. And you and I wrestle with this. Is it true? Is it worth it? And as our faith grows, our doubt begins to recede. The control or power it may have at certain times in our life, well, it loses its grip. And faith is both a choice and it's also a supernatural gift. And as we choose to believe it's true and we decide that it's worth it and we begin to live that way, then this faith grows and doubt loses its grip over our lives. So maybe you're struggling with doubt or maybe somebody you love is struggling with doubt. And over the next few minutes, we're gonna be talking about a passage from John chapter six that I hope really connects with you and encourages you. And then we're gonna end up with three points that are so simple, but yet so important that if you do them, if you choose to live this way, everything for you can be different. I'm gonna pray for you. And, then and if you have something in your life you'd like to pray about, if you have a burden that you're bearing for yourself or somebody else, um, uh, feel free just to come on up and just grab one of them and just share it. There's just something about sharing the burden, about having somebody else pray with you or for you or for someone in your life that just takes so much pressure off and adds so much strength and even brings peace. And so feel free to do that. Hey, hey Brian, Crystal, wait a second. I gotta get you two guys real quick. I wanna, I know you're not expecting this. Don't worry. Yeah, it's not sin confession time or anything. Come on up here. I just want an illustration that just sort of happened on the fly. Come on over to the middle. Um, this happened in between services and, uh, and I thought it was kind of hilarious. So let's sort of reenact this. Now, you see that Brian, I'll go over here where I'm supposed to be. Um, you see Brian and I are sort of dressed a little bit alike this morning. As a matter of fact, Brian made a comment that I didn't know about till later that now I'm trying to up my fashion game to dress like him. So I'm trying, I'm doing my best to, to do that. So we're standing together and I'm standing like this and you're about right here. And my wife, Joy, is right here. She wouldn't come up for the reenactment. She, she's a conscientious objector. Um, and so we're just standing. And so I just switched around and I was standing on this side and Brian's standing right there next to Joy and we're dressed the same. Now, Crystal, what did you see happen? Joy um, was like, I'm gonna go to kids church and put a granola bar in Brian's pocket and then went to walk away. And my jaw just dropped did because she put, that's- like, Did she tuck two fingers in his pocket? She like- I, I would rather not. <laughs> We're friends. I'd rather not say. So I, I didn't see any of it. And you're just being like, whatever, right? You're a musician. So th like th things like that happen all the time to musicians, yeah. right? I, yeah. Yeah. So Crystal's like, oh, oh, you know, I, she's laughing, right? I, yeah. And I said, what in the world happened? So you point at the granola bar and then my wife realizes what happened. And, and of course she didn't mean to, right? And so Brian pulls the granola bar and hands it to me. And it was all, well, I didn't want it after it had been in his pocket. <laughs> So I'm trying to give it away. Uh, and Joy's like, well, you know, I didn't mean to. I was just glad she didn't reach around and give him a little pat because Joy gets handsy sometimes and you got to watch her um, with, with me. Um, and so, of course, I, had, I, I didn't doubt for a second that it was an accident. Did you? You didn't doubt for a second. No, why? You, I didn't, you were about I didn't to, doubt. No, no, you no. were going to put her on the prayer list, weren't you? Yeah, Crystal's walking away Maybe. and she's texting me. Thank you guys very much. So that really happened. Now. I did, they did great, didn't they? And unfortunately that really happened. And I'm not mad about it. We'll just talk, talk later um, about that. A little counseling will help. Um, I didn't doubt that Joy did it by accident. Why? Because I, I know her. I've chosen to believe and I've come to know that what she says is true. And I'm gonna show you that that's true in our spiritual life as well in just a couple of minutes. That you choose to believe and you come to know. And when you choose to believe and you come to know, then your faith supersedes any doubt that you may have. Jesus was talking to a group of people. He had just done a miracle, he fed, fed them, some 25,000 people, given them a free lunch, talked to them about all the things he was gonna do to bless them. They made fun of him, the crowd, asked him for more snacks, asked him what he was gonna do to prove who he was. Jesus went over to the other side of a lake to get away and have some R&R &R and the crowd followed him. So Jesus began to teach some things that were complicated, that were difficult to understand. He did it on purpose. 
he began talking about how he was the Messiah, how he was the way to heaven and how he was in fact God. And the crowd, they said, you're not God. You grew up just around the corner from here. We know your parents and you're just a guy. And Jesus' heart was breaking because he knew he was losing the crowd. He wanted so badly for them to follow him. And I know that Jesus' heart breaks when we choose not to follow and when we choose to walk away. They were evaluating everything Jesus said by is it true and is it worth it? And you'll see that as Jesus escalated his statements more and more polarizing, that to choose me, that you choose me and you deny yourself, you walk away, you live a different way. That many of the crowd decided that they weren't gonna follow him anymore. Now he did word it in ways that were very difficult to understand and the crowd knew he was speaking spiritually, but yet it was still very important. And we pick up in John chapter six with a brokenhearted Jesus who wanted badly to gather people to himself for the purpose of reconciling them to God, for being a blessing in their life, for allowing them to, to live a different way, to be a different person. And we pick up here at the end of this exchange and we see that on hearing this truth or these truths about who Jesus was, many of his disciples said, this teaching is too hard, it's difficult, it's, it's, um, it's an obstacle that we just can't wrap our minds around the fact that you are God and that we aren't and we have to, to live for you. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does it offend you? Then what if you even see me go back to where I came from, if I ascend? And he said, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. And, and he goes on and he says, the words I've spoken to you, they're full of the spirit and life, yet there's some of you who don't believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them didn't believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the father has enabled them. And then one of the most sad statements in the Bible happens, and it's familiar to you, but yet we need to understand the enormity of it. From this time, many of his disciples, and the word here is just simply methetes, it's just the people who were hanging out with Jesus, the ones who were part of the crowd. And the crowd had started following Jesus because some of them were just following the crowd because it was a crowd. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just seen the crowd and gone, there's something to see, I'm gonna go. There are a lot of people who like it, so why not? I'm gonna go check it out. Sometimes if everyone looks a certain direction, you look that direction too, because obviously there's something interesting. And so the crowd was there and they're like, huh, they like it, I'm gonna check it out. And then Jesus did miracles and tricks and stuff and fed them. And so they were there and they were listening, but they really weren't taking it in. Is it true? Uh-uh. Is it worth it? No way. From this time, many of them, they turned back and no longer followed Jesus. And Jesus' heart broke. The worst choice a person could ever make in their entire lives. The choice to turn away and no longer follow Jesus. So Jesus looks at the 12 and he said, you don't wanna to leave too, do you? Can you imagine how brokenhearted Jesus might've been? Dejected, perhaps even sitting down by that point, you know, exhausted after doing miracles and hanging out and teaching and ministering. And he looks at his disciples and he says, eye contact guys, let's have a moment. Can you just, you know, just like in the boat, do you wanna to go too? And then Peter, he speaks up again. Remember Peter from before? And he gives one of the most powerful and encouraging things, says one of the most powerful and encouraging things that you could ever read in all of the New Testament. Right after Jesus' question, do you wanna to leave too? Is your doubt overcoming you? Have you decided it's not true, it's not worth it? And Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Because that's a really important part of doubt. Doubting can be a part of life as long as when you wonder, you don't wander off from the things that you've decided and you know to be true. That as you wrestle and as you struggle, that you struggle here and with the people who, who you've known and who you trust and who believe the same things that, that you believe. Have you ever seen somebody who chooses to, to leave the crowd that they know will point them the right direction? and find the crowd that will embrace the bad decisions. And Peter said, Lord, whom, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know 
that you are the Holy One of God. Now we're gonna really drill down on this for just a second. And I wanna talk to you about faith because as your faith grows, your doubt loses its grip. Faith grows, doubt goes. Faith grows, doubt goes. So here's a definition of faith. Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And faith is both a decision that you make and it's a gift that God gives. It's a decision that you make and a gift that God continues to give. And as you make a decision and make the right decisions, God continues to give the gift and your faith grows and your doubt begins to go. But if you're not making the right decision, if you don't put yourself in the place where your faith can grow, your doubt can consume you and destroy you. It's not about whether you doubt, it's about what you do with it. And so as we drill down, we see that faith has three parts. In whom do we believe? What do we believe? And why do we believe? And Peter said, you, Jesus, I believe in you. You have the words of eternal life. You know what you're talking about. We have come to believe and to know. Now, remember my story just a second ago, the illustration about joy and about marriage, about the granola bar in the pocket, about having to give the benefit of the doubt, which of course I did, right? About the understanding or realization that I have to wear much different clothes than our worship pastor, or things like that happen, right? I stood before some friends and family, my dad doing a ceremony, and God, 34 and three-fourths years ago, December 30th, 1989, and I said to my wife, I do. I believe. I believe you're the one for me. And she said, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're the one for me, so let's go ahead and see what happens. It sounded like I do, and we did. Now, we came to believe. Now, you see this as the disciples say this. You, you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe. And then there's another statement, and to know, and those are very, very different. Because belief is a decision in time and know is something that happens over time as your faith grows. I know my wife now after 34 years. And I know what it's like to be married, but 34 years ago, I had no clue what it was like to be married. I could have told you what it was. I'd be wrong. How many of you have been married? I mean, you know, you think you're an expert. You stand up there as a kid making the most important decision of your life. And you're like, oh, I know what this is all about. You don't know nothing. And then some of you have been married a long time. How long have you been married, Bob? 70 years, you, 67, you can write a book on that. So he believed at one point in his life as a young man and he came to know over time, just like spiritually our faith, it grows over time and we have mental acceptance and spiritual growth as we choose to make the right decisions and live for Jesus. But the only way we grow in our faith is to stick it out and to apply these truths and let God do his work. Because when faith builds, doubt diminishes. Luke chapter 11, verse 28 is a verse that just came to me last night and I'm ending this a different way than I intended to. But I think it's really important. And to me, as I've wrestled with this the entire week, I've just it's kind of how my week ended. And I just want to share this with you. Luke chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says that if you hear these words and you obey these words, he makes a promise and says, you will be blessed. That obedience brings blessing. Now, one of the things that is part of this blessing or a primary thing is that our faith grows. And the gift that God gives through our obedience is a growing faith and a diminishing doubt. The doubt loses its power as our faith continues to grow. And I was thinking about this passage and it's very, very simple. The first thing I wanna point out is, is when we obey the truths in the word of God, even in the little things, 
little things become big blessings. But sometimes we don't even trust God in the little things. Now I'm gonna grab my stool because I want us to sit here and I forgot it. I was all excited about the girl, the bar gate and all that kind of stuff. But I wanna sit down so we can have a moment here. Sometimes we never get past the little things to be able to get to the big things and our faith doesn't, doesn't really grow. And when our faith doesn't grow, our doubt continues to grow and we find ourselves constantly in the battle of, is it true, is it worth it? And even many of us have decided it's true, but when we have to make really hard life decisions and answer the question, is it worth it? We don't decide that it's worth it, but we come back and we attack, is it true? And we fall into the loop and it's so important to even start applying these little things. You guys this morning have applied a little thing. Now to you, it may not be a little thing. To me, it's not a little thing, it's a big thing. You're here this morning. You've made it to church. If you're online, you've joined us. Thank you for joining us online. I love that you've joined us online. I think being here as often as we can is really important. So I encourage you to come and be part of this. The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of the saints as some are in the habit of doing. Why? Because we need each other. And because God blesses us as we're here together, collectively and individually, and there's something special about carving out an hour a week. I mean, my goodness, an hour a week on a regular and consistent basis that tells the Lord, you're more important than anything else in my life. And the way you tell the Lord that is the same way you tell your spouse or your kids that. The way we spell love is T-I-M-E. And it's hard and it's countercultural and it requires a little sacrifice. But when we begin to do it, you know, because you've experienced that if you've done this, that God blesses you and your family as you order your life and your calendar around committing to spiritual things. Something small like giving an offering. Jesus tells us that where our heart is, there our treasure is. If you want to know where your heart is, look at your money. Easy in some respects to give God money right? I want to be part of what you're doing. I want to be part of your kingdom. I want to invest, but difficult because it's my money. I work for it. God, you didn't work for it. In reality, God gave us the job and the ability and the gift, and it's all his. And God tells us throughout all of the New Testament over and over again, that if we trust him with everything we have, that he blesses us, that he always blesses us. But yet when it comes down to it, we say, yeah, it's probably true because Jesus said it, but it's not worth it. So I'm not going to do it. And we never experience the benefit of a growing faith. And we say I'm consumed with doubt, but yet don't take those steps of obedience, even in the little things. And we wonder why we're like James says, a ship in a storm on a sea without a rudder tossed about waiting to smash into the rocks. And then the decisions become a little bigger because some of the claims in scripture are a little bit tougher. They're a little difficult. Forgiveness well, yeah, I know Jesus says forgive. He tells us to forgive like he forgave. And I believe it's true, but I'm not going to do it. And we wonder why our faith doesn't grow, but why our doubt consumes us. Is it true? Is it worth it? Well, it's not worth it, so it can't be true. For some, even the things that Jesus talks about with sex and sexuality, sex is between a husband and a wife in a committed marriage relationship and shouldn't be expressed in any other way. And we say it's true because it's in the Bible and Jesus talks about it and Paul talks about it and, and it's important, but it's just not worth it. So we go back and we attack, is it true? Probably not true because it's not worth it. And our faith doesn't grow and our doubt consumes us. And as James says, we're like a ship in a sea, in a storm without a rudder, going wherever life and circumstances choose to take us. Career decisions with our time as a man or as a woman, busy schedule, you want me to rearrange my life to be able to serve my kids? Nah, they're here to serve me. Well, is it true? Well, yeah, I believe the Bible teaches that I'm a parent first. Is it worth it? Nah, not really. I've got to do me. They'll be around when I'm done. Consumed by doubt, diminishing faith. Is it true? Is it worth it? And as Jesus taught more and more about the truths of what it meant to be a believer, a Christian, he said, guys, if you just do these things that you find in my word, I'll bless you and you will experience freedom. But on the other side, you see is bondage. 
you see it as rules, but when you embrace this stuff, you'll have a dynamic and growing and live faith. And perhaps you move past some of the struggles that have trapped you, maybe even for years, and maybe even have you on the verge of wondering whether you're gonna walk away. Is it true? I believe it is. Is it worth it? I know it is. Will I do it? That's the question. Don't let doubt freak you out. It's part of life. You're a smart person. You are rational, most of you. Reasonable, most of you. Logical, some of you, right? I'm just kidding. Doubt's normal. And the only way to combat that is to choose to believe and to come to know. And that coming to know is what we do together each and every week as we open up God's word and look at it and do our best to do what it says. Jesus said, don't doubt. Too good to be true? Nope. Because he told us that that's the way it should be. Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I pray that as we wrestle in our own lives with things that that we know we probably should be beyond or past, but yet we still continue to struggle. If we're honest with you and with ourselves, oftentimes we don't even do the, the most basic things that we know to do, the truths that are found in your word, that we tell you that we want it our way, that we want our lives our way, our schedules our way, our finances our way, our relationships our way, but we still expect you to grow our faith. We still wonder why we struggle with doubt. And just as the disciples apparently just their, their future just hung in the balance of just a decision and a moment in time that we, that we read about in John chapter six, as they decided to stay and everything changed for them. As they understood what that meant, that they were going to live life your way and not theirs and embraced it, even though they didn't know everything there was to know. I pray that we would do the same thing. Understanding that we don't have to know everything to believe something. And today, Father, we choose to trust you. Grow our faith so that our doubt dies and we can live this life you've planned for us to live and experience and accomplish the purpose that you've laid out for us long before we were even born. I pray these things in Jesus' name.